don't do it in any condemnation. It's sobering. I go, because I know how I lived. I felt like my family owed me. I felt like they owed me just because I went to work and made money to pay bills. I felt like they had to do everything the way that pleased me. They were my subjects, not my family. I know how I was before I was saved. It frightens me to think that I was living that way and had the capacity to function that way for 33 years and still say, I love you. And then Jesus comes and reveals himself to me. And in my mind, I'm the most selfish man that ever lived on the planet. And what I saw in my heart was so wretched, I couldn't live that way another day because it's absolutely a zero. I actually had a revelation that my life and my motives were taking me to a big fat zero. And then when I read the Bible and it says, unless a seed dies and falls to the ground, it abides alone. Now I get it. Because if I just live every day pursuing me, my well-being, my welfare, even my blessing, my provision, you can spiritualize it all you want. If you're a Christian for you and your own gain, that's not why we're Christians. You're gonna, you're, it's a big mistake. You're going to have a terrible time. <laughs> and that's not negative speech. I'm not prophesying doom. If you're a Christian for you, you're in trouble. It's unscriptural. The Bible says if you follow me, you better deny yourself. You don't be a Christian for your gain, your sake, your marriage to be restored, or you to get the job you went to school for. You become a Christian to become the person that he created you for from the beginning, that he intended man to be from day one. And you give up the old so you can become the new. And you die to the old man and his deeds so you can live to the new man. Who's he, Colossians 3.10? He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Do you see what the gospel is? A restoration back to the image of God in man. It's back to the way it was in the first place. <laughs> I look over the last few generations and what it slowly gravitated into in this self-centered thing. Man, we got people mad at God, discouraged. There's discouraged people that go to church. We can't hardly talk about it because it's expected. Well, of course there's discouragement. This discouragement's a giveaway. Your eyes are on you. You say, you don't know what I'm going through right there. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> No, thanks for helping me. That's the giveaway. Because what he went through is supposed to trump that. Because you die to yourself and give your life back to him. And then he lives in you and lives his life through you. So if he wasn't discouraged when they called him a liar, you probably shouldn't be discouraged because they blamed you for something at work you didn't do. So if he didn't get mad and speak deceit out of his mouth, we probably should be careful in that moment. Because <laughs> if death and life is in your tongue, it's probably important what comes out. Because we just blame everything on the will of God. <laughs> we just blame everything on the sovereignty of God. And then men believe that everything that happens is God. Instead of taking the privilege they've been given to walk in the Spirit and live by the Spirit and speak life and sow kingdom seeds and reap kingdom things. To love and make peace and show mercy and see men for their value, not their faults. And be able to weep for people instead of weep because of people. Boy, that's a good transition. You know where I got all this stuff? From Jesus. <laughs> I'm reading my Bible one day and I realized on the night he was betrayed he laid down his life and gave his blood in his body 
on the night he was betrayed. And I thought on the night we're betrayed, we call a friend and cry. <laughs> Tell them all about the betrayal and then say, pray for me. And then your friend spiritualizes the conversation and prays some blessing over your emotions so you feel better. <laughs> and we call that Christianity. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I mean, if that's where we're living from, we're just one moment away from falling out and falling apart. We're just a people button away from shipwrecking. We're just one injustice away. And then two injustices. Oh, God forbid. On the night he was betrayed, he gave his life. Not being mean, follow me tonight. If we're Christians, we understand because we already gave ours. So I'm just talking to Christians. If you're not a Christian, why not? It's the most humble, beautiful, amazing thing that all God would ask you to do is give back what you never were created for. Give back what you are not. Right, right. He's just asking for your life. People, Christians say, pastors say, this gospel will cost you everything. It just costs you what you never were. Right. There it is. Give back the lie so you can have the truth. Yes. And that truth's going to make you free. And he that the Son sets free, he's going to stay free because he sees. So his life's not his own. So he lays down his life. Come on, it's just good and sober. It's good to hear it out of about 10 different people. How easy it is it to just wake up and not take heed of the things you've heard. The Bible says take heed of the things you've heard. It's in Hebrews 2. It's right there. It takes earnest heed, earnest heed. That's even more than taking heed. Take earnest heed of the things you've heard, lest they slip away. 